Hello there. After the pause in news, while we waited for the mystery around patch 10.2.6 to be resolved, this week sees a return to normal service with a bunch of major new news for both retail and classic. The biggest news on the retail side was the launch of the PTR for Dragonflight Season 4 on Tuesday. It's fair to say that this was a fairly low key release with the PTR going up prior to Blizzard's announcement, which itself left as many unanswered questions as it provided details for. We have known since the post BlizzCon interviews to expect Season 4 to essentially be a Dragonflight's greatest hit season, similar to Season 4 in Shadowlands, and that's pretty much exactly what we got. On the raiding front, the three Dragonflight raids will be on a weekly rotation, where one raid gets a new Awakened buff. This will award the usual increased rewards, and there will also be a new mount, the Voyaging Wilderling, for completing all three raids in the rotation in normal difficulty or higher. There are also going to be portals to the raid entrances that can be earned for completing the raids on Mythic difficulty. There's currently no mention in any Awakened affixes for the raid from Blizzard, and we're not able to check in the PTR yet if there is one, so it's kind of unclear if we are going to see an affix similar to what we saw in Season 4 of Shadowlands. While Blizzard have confirmed that the head of the curve in cutting end achievements for a weird result will be removed when Season 4 starts, in Shadowlands, the curve mount was actually still available during Season 4 without the achievement, and there's currently no information from Blizzard if this is also going to be the case this time around. My personal advice is that if you are chasing that mount to work on the assumption that it won't be available until we hear otherwise from Blizzard if that is their plan to keep it into Season 4. The Dinar system is also making a return and is now called the Antique Bronze Bullion. This offers weapons, trinkets and necks, all of which have their own upgrade track along with some cosmetic items which includes the Shadowlands Season 4 raid mount, the Slime Cat Jigglesworth Senior. There's currently no information on the drop rates of the currency nor how the gear will be upgraded, but the amount of stuff you can obtain makes me think that it will likely be a lot more generous than in Shadowlands. Now for me personally, returning to the same three raids that I've spent months in already this expansion isn't super exciting. I currently raid with a fairly casual social team and I expect they will continue doing the raids and I'll surely go along. But honestly, if I was pugging, I'd probably only have done these raids once for the mount and left it at that. For Mythic Plus, we have already had the announcement of the changes to the dungeon difficulty levels. If you missed that announcement, I have put a link to the news article where I covered this on screen just now. We did get confirmation from the PTR that the dungeon portals are going to be awarded from Mythic Plus 10 keys, which will be at the same level of difficulty as the current season's plus 20s. We also got the final confirmation that it will indeed be the eight Dragonflight dungeons that are in the rotation. This is something that had been hinted to by Blizzard for a while, it was even mentioned in some of the post BlizzCon interviews, so there's no real surprises there. The Mega Dungeon is not included in the Mythic Plus rotation which makes sense, but it is also being retuned in difficulty for the Heroic and Mythic Zero difficulties so they match the rest of the season. For Keystone Master, there is going to be a new mount, the Infinite Armoridden. While a fresh rotation in Mythic Plus will be very welcome, for me the Dragonflight dungeons have been my least favourite bit of the Mythic Plus seasons in this expansion, with only two of the dungeons, Algathar Academy and Halls of Infusion, being ones that I personally enjoyed, and there's at least three in that rotation that I actively dislike. All of this means that on the sea's surface, this season is a lot less appealing for me. That said, Blizzard in their patch notes have shared some pretty major nerfs to all of the dungeons, with some going as far as to reduce damage from some trash packs by as high as 50%. Now, the changes that Blizzard have made to Halls of Infusion, in my personal opinion, it will likely make it a bit of a favourite for a lot more players than just me this time around, but I do think that a couple of the other dungeons, such as Azure Vault and Notharis, probably need a little bit more than Blizzard have announced to date. That said, the proof is always going to be in the pudding and I'm going to reserve full judgement until we can get into playing these on live. And I do think that along with these nerfs, the big increase in player power that we've had in Season 3 and Season 4 will likely serve to make these dungeons feel a lot better. So I'm still going to keep my fingers crossed that the season is going to at least get close to Season 3, although I don't actually think it's going to reach the heights that Season 3, which in my opinion was the best Mythic Plus dungeon season ever, 
managed to reach. Now over in the PV prefront, it also gets the usual seasonal bumps and rewards. There's a new gladiator mount, most likely the draconic gladiator straight, and a new vicious mount, the vicious dream talent, along with a bunch of updated titles. One difference from Shadowlands Season 4 is that the open world content this time around is getting a bit more attention. As well as the increase in gear item level rewards that was announced in the roadmap, the weekly Aiding the Accord quest is being updated to rotate, most likely along with the raid. The Dragon Isles version of this will ask us to do the three main events, Dragonbane Keep, the Centre Hunts and the Tuscar Feast. The Zaralek Caverns one will be Researchers Under Fire, the chest for the Farak Assault Camp and a Time Rift. And the Emerald Dream one will ask us to collect Dream Surge Coalescence from the Dream Surges, do a Super Bloom and plant three seeds. None of these quests have any rep requirements like the current quests, but do keep in mind that that can change during the PTR. One nice thing is that these quests currently seem to offer a champion level gear item, which is a step up from the veteran level gear that the open world rewards in Season 3 were effectively capped at. There has also been a set of data mined reputation buffs offering 10% extra rep with the various factions associated with the three areas in the rotation, and I guess that these buffs will likely rotate along with the available quest. Now, this buff hasn't gone live in the PTR so far, so it isn't guaranteed that this is something we'll actually see in a live game when it comes out. Another unknown at the moment is the world bosses. In Shadowlands, they were part of the rotation, but there's really no indication of that happening in the PTR, nor did Blizzard make any mention of it in their announcements. But to me, it does seem logical that they would include the world bosses, so my guess is that we probably will see something later on in the PTR, or perhaps when this comes out on live. That's pretty much all we know about Season 4 currently. There's definitely no big surprises, and for me personally, also not really much to excite. Unlike Shadowlands, where it was obvious that a 9.3 was not really feasible without delaying Dragonflight into 2023, which was something really nobody wanted, this time around, I could see a path where a 10.3 could have worked out. I don't know if there's an internal reason that the team could not do that, or if they just learned the wrong lessons from Shadowlands Season 4, but I cannot help by being disappointed by Season 4 overall. At the very least, I would have liked to have seen Blizzard push a bit harder into giving us something new. Something even simple like a pass on the BFA raids to make especially the Mythic ones more accessibly soloable could have added some fresh content to do, especially for the open world folks. In my view, while 10.2 was pretty decent, the open world content it, and it really didn't have the depth to support such a long time until we get some more meaty new content. But what about you? Are you excited for Season 4? Would you have preferred another raid tier or even a mini raid? Let me know in the comments below. That said, it is worth keeping in mind that Dragonflight isn't over yet, and we were reminded of that by executive producer Holly Longsdale this week, who sent out a message to the community to remind us that even after Season 4, the team do still have plans for some more PvE-focused content, including another experiment. Now, Holly didn't go into any details on what that experiment was, so this was more of another announcement of an announcement, but my guess is that this is a reference to Patch 1027 and the time-running Pandemonium feature, about which we know very little so far. Certainly though, that patch does look like it could be the most interesting of the post-10.2.0 patches, so there's definitely still more to look forward to. Even closer than that, and this Monday, the 1st of April, we will see the start of the Noble Garden Holiday event. There has been a new mount data mined for this event, the Noble Flying Carpet, so there's at least something new to look forward to. The Love is in the Air event was completely revamped to much success this year, and while it may be a little too much to expect the same treatment for this, there are some indications in the game data, which I won't go into details here to avoid spoilers, that suggest at least a few changes to Noble Garden are in the pipeline. At the end of April, we'll also get the Northrend Cup Dragon Riding Race series. I've had a lot of fun during these races and are super looking forward to revisiting Northrend. There has been a couple of new Dragon Racer appearances data mined, and one of those I suspect will be the reward for this event. 
The new Plunderstorm minigame also got some more love this week, with a further 50% buff to Plunder Drops, which will likely be very welcome for players still grinding out the Renown track. I myself did notice a jump in the rates of Plunder I was getting starting on Tuesday, especially in shorter matches. There were also some pretty major tuning adjustments to try to balance out some of the abilities, and the right hand side of the map has had a lot more NPCs added into the open areas. This too is very welcome, as I personally did find it harder to farm plunder whenever I landed in that side of the map. Finally, the UI for the plunder storm has been updated to now have a kill counter, which will surely benefit the more PvP focused players. Last week I covered the new meta achievement for Dragonflight, a world awoken, which rewards Taivan as a mount. Since then Blizzard have hotfixed the rewards for the meta and it turns out there's a load of more mounts that can be earned from it, including the bestowed Ahuna Spotter for completing the Waking Shore section, the bestowed Thunderspine Pack Leader from the Naran Plains, the bestowed Trolling Mammoth from the Azure Span, the bestowed Otter Vanguard from Thordrazis, the bestowed Sand Skimmer from Time Rifts, the Coruscale Salamantha from Primal Storms, the Storm Touch Bruffalon for completing most of the Dragon Isles, the Coruscale Shieldwing from Zaralite Caverns, and the Black Scales appearance for the Netherwing Drakes, which comes from the Dragon Ride races. All in all, for Mount Collectors, this is turning this achievement into quite a beefy bit of content. I personally had a lot of the achievements already done and I'm getting quite close to completing it all, albeit the Forbidden Reach one is proven to be the toughest. Overall, this does seem to be easier than the BFA one, so I suspect quite a lot more folks will be going for this than was the case back then. Now one element of the achievement that has been getting some attention in the community is the Storm Chaser achievement. This requires killing 200 enemies in each of type of the storms in each of the zone. That's not too bad in and of itself, however many players have been finding that the distribution of the storms is making it very hard to complete. According to the Lord of the Rains Discord, in the EU in the last 6 days there were 30 storms in the Azure Span with between only 4 and 7 storms in the other zone. While in theory random distributions can display clusters of this type, it does look a little bit odd to me and is certainly making the achievement much harder than it needs to be. A similar issue is also happening on the US servers, but there the bias seems to be more towards the waking shores. This week the dev team did remove the seasonings cache from the Zaralite Caverns part of the achievement, most likely due to that having been a scavenger hunt mechanic similar to Legion's long forgotten hippogriff, so hopefully this issue with the storms is also something that the team will address. As well as tweaking the distribution to work better, back at launch the storms used to spawn in pairs before they were reduced down to one around about the time of 10.07, and reverting back to having two storms I think would help this achievement a lot. Now is this achievement that you're excited for? Have you already done it all? Or is this the kind of thing that you would just like to avoid like the plague? Do let me know in the comments down below. Moving over to Classic, it's also got some major announcements this week. For Season of Discovery, we got the release date for Phase 3, which is going to be April the 4th. Phase 3 includes 6 new runes to collect, a new outdoor PvE event, Nightmare Incursions, which is where players can enter the Emerald Nightmare. There's also a new PvP reward system with better itemization and a new 20 player raid the Sunken Temple, where you can travel to the Temple of Atul Hakar. There's also three new dungeons opening up, Blackrock Depths, Moradin and Zulfarak. Moving over to Wrath of the Lich King Classic and the first steps towards the Cataclysm PTR have begun with the opening up of Operation Nomregon and Zalazane's Fall. These are limited time events where the Alliance can help the gnomes recover their homelands and the Horde can help out the trolls. These are limited open world events which act as a kind of prequel for the main Cataclysm pre-patch. We've no firm date for that yet, but the original version lasted for about 7 weeks, and I think it's a fair guess that it will either be similar or a little bit shorter this time around. The last piece of news is something that emerged just after my news video last week, which was a report on the Korean website Invin covering a retrospective of Shadowlands by John Height, the SVP of the Warcraft franchise that he presented to the recent gaming industry annual conference, GDC. 
This was also picked up by Bellula, who did an analysis of the information presented to arrive at an estimated subscriber number, which is currently a lot higher than I suspect most people had expected. Bellula estimates the number at over 7 million subscribers. Now that presentation also did confirm the scale of the drop-off in numbers that happened during the middle of Shadowlands, where the numbers actually near enough halved, which honestly, looking at how Shadowlands played out, wasn't really all that much of a surprise, I think, to many of us. I'm going to link Bellula's video down below as it does include important context of how he arrived at those numbers. While these numbers are guesstimates, Jess Corden of Windows Central has said that his own independent sources have confirmed that the numbers are in the right ballpark. What is also of interest is that while Dragonflight got off to a much lower than expected start, numbers wise, it appears to have reversed the long term trend where expansions would start high and then drop off, and instead has seen a mid expansion growth in numbers. Albeit it's not super clear how much of this is due to Dragonflight and how much of it is due to Season of Discovery. As well as the numbers, we also got captures of another two slides that were very interesting to me. The first slide is John's thoughts on why the Shadowlands played out how it did. Now I have to say many of the points in this slide do resonate with me a lot in terms of my own experience, especially those referring to the lack of the development of the Jailer as an antagonist and the lack of transparency in their communication. For me, it's great to see this level of self-awareness from the team and the leadership, and I feel that it does explain both the improvements we have seen to date, but also bodes well for the future. Another slide capture I haven't seen covered much anywhere else is this one that appears to cover why John thinks the franchise is enduring. In many ways, this slide covers all the good things that the team have been doing in the post-Shadowlands era. Albeit, I do think that the team still have some more work to do, especially when it comes to honing their community engagement. While the classic team have been leading the way in this front, the retail side, in my view, still has quite a bit of catching up to do. And in many ways, this talk is an example of that. While it's great to see John share details like this, frankly, in an external forum, it is a shame that Blizzard seemed reluctant to share something like this directly with their player base. While the response, I think, would be bumpy, to say the least, knowing the community the way I do, I think that sharing something like this with the player base could do much to help regain the trust that the team lost during the BFA and Shadowlands era. GDC talks often do get made available to the public well after the event, and I do hope that this is the case for this talk, as honestly, a few slides, while very interesting, lack a lot of the context that I suspect John would have added in his talk, and I for one would be loved to hear him speak. Well, that's all for this week's news. If you've enjoyed this video, do please let me and YouTube know by hitting that like icon. And if you want to support my channel, the best way to do that is to hit the subscribe icon and also make sure to hit the bell icon so that you get notified whenever a new video goes live. That's all for now and I will see you all again soon.